Today's reading is from Psalm 10. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. His ways are always prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at all his enemies. He says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. He swears, no one will ever do me harm. His mouth is full of lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent. His eyes watch in secret for his victims. Like a lion in cover, he lies in wait. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. His victims are crushed, they collapse. They fall under his strength. He says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and never sees. Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me to account? But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would not otherwise be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Welcome to Redeemer Lincoln Square again. It's good to be back. Um, earlier this summer, I was actually with a, a fellow uh, pastor. He's a good friend of mine. We went to college together. Um, we grew up together. We actually did college ministry together. And now we're both uh, head pastors of our churches. And as he sat and talked with me, he was able to put to words feelings that I had. That's what happens when you kind of know each other so well. The other person kind of knows you almost better than you know yourself. And he'd be like, Michael, hadn't you... Hadn't you thought of it this way? How, couldn't you consider it, uh, you know, that way? And I'm like, yes, that's it. That's exactly it. Because he could put to words feelings that I couldn't uh, put to think about or, or, or cognitize myself. The Psalms do the same thing for us. The Psalms that we've been going through every single week during the summer, that we've been meditating on, that we've been reading, that we've been thinking about, uh, to bring us into a space to cultivate time with the Lord, one of the treasures of the Psalms is that they put to words feelings that we have, and in so doing, we learn how to pray. There's a lot of folks that don't know how to pray. There's a lot of us who don't know how to make, do certain prayers. And the Psalms have them all. If you don't know how to pray, you don't know where to start, the Psalms are your friends. You have happy psalms so that you can do happy prayers. You have sad psalms so you can do sad prayers and everything in between. And so what we're doing today, this particular psalm, in light of the prayer of lament that we just had, is going to work through to help us deal with despondency. I know we're Americans. I know nobody wants to go into the ucky feelings, but they're there whether you know it or not. And so what we're going to do today is that we're going to get down into the weeds and say, why, O oh Lord, are you like this? Why are, do, does it seem like you're allowing evil to prosper? What do we do with it? How do we handle that feeling? Why does it look like, look at verse 1, it seems like the Lord stands far off and hides himself in times of trouble. What do we do with that? We don't have, we don't have the time to list all the injustices uh, of the world. I think a lot of you already know them. They're ever-present. They're before us every single day. We don't have time to talk about how one in four women will will be sexually abused at some point or um, sexually assaulted some point in their lifetimes. We don't have time to talk about the millions of people who are sex trafficked. We don't have time to talk about the world poverty, the hunger, the hurt, the disease. 
We don't have time. We don't even have time to talk about how in this country in 1865, the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery, if you read the actual amendment, this is what it says. It says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude could occur except as punishment for a crime. And when I read that, I go, wait a second, that doesn't actually outlaw slavery. In fact, what, you, what happened was, slavery could happen as long as it was punishment for a crime. And so what ensued is for decades after that, up to 800,000 mostly black, but all kinds of mostly men, were re-enslaved as part of the penal system. What that means is that it, in some states, laws were created that if you were out of work, that was a crime, and you were re-enslaved. And this happened all the way up until World War II, but we know the generational repercussions are still ongoing. Those injustices are still with us. And so what do we do with that? What do we, I, 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 and I say that as an individual, for just on my side, what do I, how do I handle the, the past, the present, the ongoing nature of it? It's overwhelming. And this is where the Psalms come in. And so what we're going to look at today, we're going to look at the hidden roots of injustice, we're going to look at the hard waiting for justice, and we're going to look at where justice will come from. So the hidden roots of injustice, the hard waiting for justice, and then where will justice come from? So first, the hidden roots of injustice. Where do you see that in the text? Well, look, look in your text. There's two parties that are being sort of uh, dealt with. One is called the wicked. It, it, the, the word shows about five times. Some translations, they have, uh, they use harsher words for that, but the wicked. And then the other party, sometimes it's called the helpless, sometimes they're called victims. But they're, they're, you're, you have two parties, and these two parties have both been made in God's image. If you go to Genesis 1, we're told that all humans are made in God's image. And that means, at the very least, that all humans deserve, at some level, to uh, have equal worth, equal dignity, equal care. And yet the, the, the wicked ignore the image of God in humans so that they can do what they do. Look what they do. In verse 2, it says they hunt down the weak, the wicked. Uh, verse 8, they prey on people. They literally get away with murder. Uh, verse 5, they prosper while they do it. They add insult to injury. And what the text is kind of getting at is that you can only treat the images of God this way is that if at some level you don't believe in God. We see that here, right? In verse 4, it says, the wicked do not seek God. And there is, and this is the key phrase, there is no room for God in their thoughts. It's a really great image. There's no room for God in their thoughts. So they don't seek him, they don't desire him, they don't need him. In verse 3, to some level they revile him. And then what's so fascinating is in verse 13, they still, they hope that God will not call them to account later on in life, which I find endlessly ironic. That at one level, the wicked are like, hey, I, I deny God's reality. At another level, they're like, they're hoping that in the end, very end, like, it'll, it'll be all right for them. But let's back up for a second. And I want to really go down into this image. What does it mean that the wicked leave no room for God in their thoughts? And I was thinking about this all week long, and I think there's only two ways to have no room for God in your thoughts, right? There's only, imagine your heart is your apartment's living room. Just imagine your heart's your apartment's living room. There's only two possible reasons for why there's no room to host God in your living room. One, I've been in a lot of New York City apartments. One, maybe your living room's too small. I have seen apart, living room apartments that are too small. But the second, only other possible reason for why there might be no room in your living room is that something is in your living room that's too big. You've seen some of those big like sofa sectionals or you see some of those things that like you can't really kind of fit in there because there's too much stuff in there. It's one or the other. Either way, there's a huge problem and I want to look at both of them. First one, let's say it's too small. Um, I don't know if you noticed this, but when you uh, ask a child to give you a hug, nine times out of ten, you want to know how that hug looks like? It looks like this. Both arms, full open, boom. That's how children tend to hug people. If they, if they trust you, they are giving you everything about them. Have you ever seen, asked an adult, like you, an adult tried to hug each other? This is how, they, this is how we hug. The other day, it was like, kind of like a side hug. I was like, okay, okay, we can try to do this better, but what's going on there? 
at some level, I know, I know all the arguments. We don't want to look like we're needy. We don't want to look like we're, we're unrefined. We don't want to look like, we want to be reserved, like, hey, I'm okay, I'm good, we're good, we're all good here. You know, there's like the bro hug, it's like, ugh, ugh. There's like that was a little cough because they're not quite feeling good about what, you know, that, and then it's COVID, so now everybody's doing the, like the arm thing. Like, it's like everybody's going like this to each other. Um, what, it, maybe, is it possible, is it possible that maybe the room in our hearts are a little bit smaller? Maybe the, maybe the kids have something that we don't have. Maybe, maybe what's happened over time is our hearts have shrunk. Maybe. Um, I, I was just this past, a couple weeks ago, I lived in New York City for a long time. I was sitting at a cafe with some friends, and a woman came up and asked for some money. And I said, you know, I did the New York thing. I was like, no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. And then in this particular case, I launched with my friends, I launched into this long conversation about uh, explaining how, you know, I used to work in a homeless mission, and I used to live in London, and I, I worked with the, the poor in London. And listen, there's a lot of people that are on the streets that have mental illness. It's really not a good idea to give, uh, you know, funds straight. You should instead, because they might misuse it, you should give the money to the shelters, you should give it to the missions. Uh, this church, we, St. Paul House, which is a couple blocks away, we support St. Paul's House. And I, I had this whole long diatribe. And I got home, I got into my own thoughts, and I said, maybe my heart's just shrunk. Maybe I'm just more callous. Maybe there's just not, there's not enough room there anymore because it's too small. Now, the other way that there can be no room in your hearts is maybe there's something else in there. See, it says here, the wicked say there's no room for God in my thoughts. So we, I have, we have to ask. You can't move on before we ask, do we allow God to have room in our thoughts, right? I'm not, I'm not saying just your pious thoughts. I know you're here on Sunday or you're Zooming in right now through YouTube. But what about your financial thoughts? What about your relational thoughts? What about your career thoughts? Have, do you allow God to have a say in how you use your time? Do you allow God to have a say in what we might do. And, and if you don't, why don't you let God have a say in for various parts of your, of your life? Right? It, 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 why don't you allow him to have space in your thoughts? See, if God is real, if he is who he says he is, and therefore he knows how to live rightly, the question is, is why don't we let him more in our thoughts? And it's because, at the end of the day, for me, I don't want him to speak into that aspect of my life, into my time, into my money, into my relationships. We actually don't want the presence of what that would look like. And so this is where it gets interesting. The tendency is to read this psalm and say, oh yeah, those evildoers, those wicked people over there, those people you know, who are godless, who don't want God, to, they deny God, they're over there. But what we're not realizing is that this is actually everybody's disposition. No one seeks them out. You might not be a philosophical atheist, but I think we're all practical atheists because unless we want God in all of our thoughts, as this text says, which I think I just showed you we don't, that means we have something else in the room that is too important to us, that's more important to us than him. And I think that's what this text is showing us. It's showing us that's the case. It's also showing us what those things could be that's too big in the room. Let me give you the list. Number one, look at verse two. Arrogance. Arrogance. Deeming yourself more worthy than the other person. It's this attitude of superiority. Most people don't walk around going, I'm an arrogant person, but if you center the self on self, ego, that could be arrogance. And look at verse four. It says, the, uh, sorry, verse three. The wicked tend to boast. What's that about? How many times do I want other people to recognize what I'm doing? Hey, guys, look what I'm doing. Look what, see what I'm doing. Look, look what, what, what's happening. Look, I want you to acknowledge. I want the recognition. I want the credentials. I want the resume. See, I think what's, what's fascinating is that that actually might be arrogance. And sometimes I think this is the case. Arrogance can pretend like it's self-esteem. We live in a culture that's always like, have a high self-esteem. How many times do you... Somebody says it's self-esteem, but it's really arrogance pretending to be self-esteem. 
That could be one of the things that's, that is too big in our rooms. Secondly, verse 4. What else could be taking up room in our, in our hearts is pride. It says the wicked have pride. But what does that mean? Pride is not about being smarter. Pride is about being smarter than the others. Pride, by definition, is comparative. Bruce, earlier in the call to worship, read C.S. Lewis in our, in our bulletin. and says, this is what C.S. Lewis puts it better than anybody. He says, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. So this is what's so dark about pride, is that, oh, no, no, I don't need to be good. I just need to be better than them. I don't, I, no, 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 I don't think I'm the best, but I, at, least, at least I have something over those people over there. And so when you contrast and evaluate and assess, you're trying to decide, are you a success or a failure? And what's dirty is that you could be a failure in your own assessment, and you're actually being prideful in it, because you're actually doing the comparative nature to it. And there's... When you're so centered on you, that leaves no room for him. That's verse 4 uh, when it comes to pride. Now, thirdly, the third thing that can be taking up too much room in your, in your heart, look at verse 5. It says the wicked sneer in their hearts against their enemies. This is great. You might not be an arrogant person. You might not be a prideful person. But what you do is you sneer at the people who are. You look down on the people who are. Not, not even look down. You just point it out. It's those Christian nationalists over there. It's those anti-vaxxers. Oh, I can't believe them over there. It's those pandering progressives. It's, it's those government-controlled liberals. Oh, I can't stand them. Don't they see what's wrong with the, themselves? And you kind of roll your eyes. You know, the eyeballs get stuck in the top of your head as you're, as in, your, in your heart. Uh, that, 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 that's what this is talking about. Social media seems to be the perfect vehicle where people go on to just dunk on other people to say, gotcha. Look at that theology. Look at that politics. Look at, the, look at your methodology. And I have a sneaking suspicion. Knowing who's out is a subtle way for us to feel like we know who's in. Us. <laughs> right? I've pointed out where you're wrong, and that, that, that makes me feel a little bit better that I know where I'm right. And so I, I think... When you start looking at these lists that's found in our psalm, we're starting to see the hidden roots of injustice. If we have not let God take every thought captive, if we have not allowed him to speak into every aspect of our lives, if we have not made him king in our hearts because we're the ruler of our own lives, then that means it's quite possible all of us sitting here or, you know, YouTubing in, you might believe in God, but if you don't bring him into the inner workings of your thoughts into your, your, your fears, into your hurts, you don't really believe in him. Right, you might think you believe in him. No, you actually, you believe about him. Let's say that. You believe about him. You cognitively assent to his idea. But to believe in him, in his actions, in his words, in his life applied to you, you really don't. And that's where the hidden roots of injustice is found. It's actually found in our hearts. That's the surprise. When I was reading this over and over and over again, the more I read it, the, the less I saw it out there, I realized, oh my gosh, the seeds of injustice are in every one of us. And you might think, you might have some level of understanding of this, but I don't think we have the deep understanding of it. That the person that he's describing is not just over there, it's in here. Injustice then doesn't just come from oppressive groups. It, it starts with the ordinary disposition of the heart. Before we move on then, I, I want us to ask some practical questions. You might believe in God, but do you live as if he doesn't really exist in your life day to day? Do you live hour by hour with him? And if you don't, ask yourself this. Where are you not allowing God be God in your life right now? It's a scary question to ask. Where is your room in your heart too small for him, or where have you pushed him out and said, oh, sorry, there's not enough room. I got this thing over here that's too important to me that I have to have. It looks great in my room. Can't, sorry, I can't let you come in here and mess it up. I believe that you will find the hidden roots of injustice in those things, number one. All right, number two, the hard waiting for justice. Now, knowing where injustice comes from no offense, it's no solace for the lack of justice that, that we are seeing in our lifetimes and that we've seen in history. Put it this way, every tear that's been shed, 
every wrong that's gone unrighted, and there are many wrongs historically and currently that are going unrighted, every injury, every hurt, every moment where one image of God is treated less than what he or she is deserved, we have to ask, we cannot move on and say, oh well, it's just the way it is. You have to say, what's the solution? We have to say, what are we going to do about this? And the psalmist calls on God to answer for himself. This is verse 12. The climax of the text, arise God, show up, where are you? Right, verse one starts, where are you? And then he says, I know where you are, show up. This is, this is in line with the laments of the, the rest of the Bible. The psalm here is showing us the right way to speak about these things. And he says, do not forget the helpless. Do not forget the poor. Do not forget the oppressed and the afflicted and the fatherless. The word fatherless is used twice. And the reason why the psalmist uses those individuals is because they tend to be the ones who have been hurt the most. Go to Amos in the Old Testament, chapter 8, verses 4, 5, and 6. And Amos is going after the Israelites, people who are the people of God, who have set up unfair structures that are oppressing certain people. This is what it says, and I, I'm, just, I'm just quoting it. You trample the needy and do away with the poor. You skimp on the measures. You, you're bo you boast prices. You boost prices, cheat and buy the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Silver, by the way, was a, a, a way to talk about unfair loans. And you buy the poor with sandals because what you would do is, hey, you need sandals, I'll give you the money, but just pay me back. And if they couldn't pay you back, you could make them now indentured servants. And so what Amos is, is doing, he's, he's listing the injustices that have happened. And what's so fascinating is Jerusalem, the people of Israel, had laws against that. There was gleaning laws where you were supposed to allow enough food for the poor so they could live. There was the year of Jubilee where that it was supposed to be every couple years the debts were canceled and they went back. We actually have no record if that actually happened or not. We know, it was, we know it was on their law books. We don't know if they actually did it. And so what you see here is injustice still happened, and it happens today. I already quoted you a couple um, examples. I'll give you one more. Last year, after, after the year we had, we saw students who came from the lowest economic populations. They were the ones who were most likely to be remote last year. And they were also the ones most likely not to actually check in online. They were the least likely to, to have uh, Wi-Fi and then devices that could actually get them online. And so what happened was is the people who needed the education were least educated last year. It was like watching a slow-moving train wreck. And ha what happened with, with our children this past year, particularly of the poor? Look at ongoing genocide in Africa. Look at how rich countries are literally, you know what? is so heartbreaking. Rich countries are literally throwing away unused vaccines right now, and poor countries are begging for them, and, you can't, and they can't get them. It's, this is hard waiting for justice, and I don't believe this is controversial, what I'm saying. The, the, when you say the poor are being crushed, the Bible over and over and over again shows you examples of that, that they are being hurt, and the psalmist is saying in the context, where are you, God? Where are you? Now, the good news is he answers his own question. Look, look what he says next. In verse 14, he says, You see the hand, sorry, you see the trouble of the afflicted and you consider it and take it up in your hand. Now, most of modern people, we walk right over that. We're like, okay, God, God's hand. But you don't understand what it's like to be in the hand of a living God. <laughs> what, this, what this writer is saying is God sees all. He knows all. It ne nothing passes by without him acknowledging it. And so it's not, this is not an if, this is a when he's going to act. I, this, is, this was very moving to me when I first read this. I was like, oh my gosh. That means it might look like things are getting by, but nothing's actually getting by. To the na naked eye, whether you're the victim or you're the wicked, wh wherever you are in between, you don't see it, but he does. So while we're waiting on justice, the psalmist is saying, we might not know how long, we don't know why, the timing is the way it is, but we know that we're just waiting for his hand to move. Sometimes you ask, well, why is God's timeline not my timeline? And I, you know what, that is a great question, I don't know. But here's what we do know. You could work your whole life for justice and you might never see it. You might not. 
but that doesn't mean it's not going to come, and it doesn't mean it's not going to be seen. That's what this text is saying, that you can do that, and we can desperately desire it, and we might not actually see it, but one day it will happen. And the key for us is not to cycle through the normal emotional moves that the heart makes. Here's what happens. You don't see it, despondency, apathy, anger, rinse and repeat. Despondency, which I think you're seeing a lot of in our culture, apathy, which you also see a lot of, anger. And the problem with those things is despondency, what we just talked about here, is that you're forgetting the hope that he does see things and that he does hold things in his hand. If you really knew that, at the end of the day, you couldn't be fully despondent. Apathy assumes that, we, we, what is apathy? We give up, we don't care, or we, don't, we really don't know why. We think the Lord doesn't care, but that's clearly not the case. We don't have time right now to go through a whole biblical theology of the Bible, but the cross is proof positive that the wages of sin are called into account. And they, are, they, are, they, they matter, and God does something about it. And then thirdly, anger. I think we have, there's this concept of righteous anger, but I think we also overassume that our anger is righteous anger. I don't think we realize how muddied our anger really is. And as you see from our text, the wicked use their anger all the time. And so often our impatience with God's timeline can make us just as cynical as the wicked, just as, as exploitive as the wicked, we can end up being no different than them. They, they're after power, I'm going to go after power. They hurt me, I'm going to hurt them. We're actually watching a new shame and honor culture emerge out of the, the kind of you do you, you know, who really knows what truth is. That's kind of, you're watching that, the, the dying embers of that culturally go away. And what you're seeing now is a new system of you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You did this, I'm going to go, I'm going to do it back to you. And I think that's why it's so hard to wait on justice because if you've ever waited for a long time, if you've ever waited for a really long time, it's not just, you're not just sitting on your hands. There is a mental and physical challenge that's going on there. And so we might not know how it's all going to work out, but we know it will. And that's, I, I mean, let me just stop for a second. I know that's not full solace. It really isn't, which is why we have to get to our third point. Where? Where will justice finally come from? Last thing to say here. The psalm ends with the Lord King. Look what it says on the very past, the last couple of verses. The Lord King will reign forever and ever, and the wicked nations are going to perish. Happy ending, right? Yay! Small problem. The word nations in Hebrew is the word ethne. Guess who the nations are? We are the nations. And so the problem is, as we just talked about, as we noted early, everybody's hearts are not desiring for him. The nations are against him. What hope do we have then? And the answer comes down to the king who's coming. What kind of king is it? What kind of king is actually coming before us? And what we find later on in the New Testament, the king that comes is the one who strips his cloak and tunic off. He is the prodigal father who sees the son way off and doesn't care what he looks like. He goes running after him. The king takes off his riches and becomes poor and becomes afflicted. This king that we find in the Bible is not ruling with might. He's ruling with meekness. Jesus Christ showed up in the first century, Palestine. Do your history. Not a good place to be poor. He grew up in that system. Then, when it came for his trial, you should read about how the false witnesses came up against him. You should read about how unfair his trial was, how, how he was marginalized and rejected, how the government conspired against him. He ends up suffering and going into the heart of every single injustice, personal and systemic, and living it out. And friends, on the cross, the penalty of sin, the injustice that was done, in this psalm, the injustices that we see, past, present, and future, that we're not seeing in an account happen, he gets the distance, he gets the division to break up the powers and principalities of the world. I think too often Americans think of salvation individualistically, about me and him. We don't realize he's actually, as, as, my, as my brother said earlier, he's coming to come after 
the effects of sin too in this creation. And so before we end, I want to ask you this one question. How are you going to make room in your hearts? How are you not going to cloud them out again? That you will continue to have no room in your hearts as long as we think that we're the masters and commanders of our own lives. We don't let him be king. Unless you make your identity into being treasured by him, you're going to treasure something else. Unless you see yourself loved by him, you're going to love something else. It's that simple. This summer, uh, we, uh, the, my extended family got together. We went to the beach. And inevitably, with little kids, you always get a uh, bubble solution. People make bubbles. I hate that stuff. It just gets sticky, and I'm like always like, oh, yeah, you guys have fun over there. Bubbles, go have fun. But it was always fun to watch the, the little kids try to catch it and like preserve it and hold on to the bubbles. And I realized, as beautiful as they are, you should not have a calling to try to hold on to beautiful bubbles. They're always going to pop. And frankly, much in our lives are like bubbles. They're all going to pop. Your health, your looks, your job, your money, none of it is going to stay. It's all going to pop. So why the heck? I'm, a- I'm asking myself this recently. Why the heck do I spend so much time on those things? Why, do I, why am I throwing myself into blowing them up and trying to hold on to them? That don't, that they're not going to last. Hold on to him. He will last. He's never going to pop. Not in your life. So how do you start? Again, the Psalms show us. Start with prayer. Start with, Lord Jesus, it seems like you stand far off. But in truth, we realize the seeds of injustice starts with us. Be our king in my life. If you can't say that, if you don't know how to say that, I'd be, I implore you, start with that. Do you sit in that and gain your identity from that? Not from how much you have. Not from how comfortable your life will be or you want it to be. Not from living your life now. His life for you will mean that you'll never live without hope. Friends, you can be, dis- you, despondency, the normal life and cares of the world will come into your life. That's okay. But we'll never get fully down if we know the hope that we have in him. We'll never also be fully apathetic either. Because if this is how he loves, if this is what he cares about, now you, you and I can go on mission for those things too. So start with prayer first, but secondly, Pray not just for justice to roll down from the mountain, but pray also, what will our role be in it? I'm not saying, this psalm says, you know, the Lord loves the orphans. I'm not saying everybody else has to go out and, and adopt somebody. It says the Lord loves the, the, the widows. It doesn't mean everybody has to find a widow. But you should think through, what is my role? How am I going to use my time, my talents, and my treasures in this fall? I think a lot of times we're, we just sort of bumble through life. We don't, we're not, we don't take the time to ask ourselves this question. What would it look like if God rescued me when we were cast out and he didn't cast us out? What are small waves that now we can move out to rescue others the way that he rescued us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is, a, this is not one of the easier psalms, but what's so beautiful about your, your word, Father, is that every single emotion has been given, is given words. I pray that in the normal course of life, the ups and downs that we have, when we are down, when we we look at the cares of the world and we say, God, where are you? A, we're allowed to pray that. We're allowed to ask that. We're allowed to come up here and, and corporately lament homelessness. We're allowed to lament housing. We're allowed to lament the brokenness of this world. But Father, I pray that then we, we know, we might not know the timing, we might not know how or way or why but we know you will and that gives us all the, the, the it, it might not be the full answer Father but it's the main answer the full answer comes in, in what you, your life and death has accomplished for us turn our hearts and minds towards you and all that we do we praise things in your name Amen